Hi, I'm Teresa Kanan with Stitch and Tree Quilts in Woodbine, Iowa. I'm the designer of the COVID Friends Tribute Quilt. I thank you and all the shops are participating with us and following along with this quilt as we begin this amazing journey. Today I'm going to go over the nine patch setting units. Some of you have participated in the fabric exchange and if that's the case, you will soon be receiving in the mail a bundle of fabrics from across the country and each and each of those bundles will include two and a half inch strips and one and a half inch strips. Others of you have chosen not to participate in the fabric exchange and you'll just be going to your stash to grab the fabrics that you're going to be using for the nine patch units as well as the rest of the quilt. If you're using fabrics from your stash, you can use it from yardage that you've cut or I also find that binding tails work really well. For these nine patch units, we only need 12 and a half inches. So I grab the tail end of my binding that I've used on other quilts, press it out nice and flat, and I can use it for these nine patch units. What's nice about that is I take that memory of that quilt that I made in the past and I'm able to incorporate it into the quilt. The quilts themselves will have 16 different nine patch units and you can see two examples behind me of how those set. So you're going to want to introduce as much variety in those nine patches as you can. If you take a look at the pattern, the pattern will tell you that to make sure that you lay out your fabrics in advance and make sure you have a nice variety of fabric so that you're not too heavy on the purple or on the red with not enough of the yellow or the blue. You want to have a nice variety so that it lays out very beautifully on your quilt. I call that a planned scrappy approach. Let's take a look at the pattern. The pattern for the nine patch setting units includes three pages. On the first page, it has the fabric requirements, including the fabrics and the backgrounds for one setting unit. So these requirements will create one setting unit. You will need 16 setting units to finish the quilt. So you'll need to take multiples of that. Also on this first page, I tell the story of the setting for the COVID-19 coronavirus. Take an opportunity to read through that and start to think about your own setting where you came from, when you first learned of the coronavirus, what you thought when you first heard of it, and how your community, or in your case, your family or your work responded to it. On page two, at the beginning of the top of the pattern, I talk about fabric selection and making sure that you are having variety in your quilt. And I also talk about how you need to take the time to lay out the blocks on a design wall or on a bed. Because while it seems very simple to construct this nine patch unit, if you're not careful, you'll find that you end up putting some of your favorite colors always in the center. So you might have way too many with red in the center, for example. And at the bottom on page two, I have the instructions for a nine patch unit. We'll go over those as I continue in the video. The last page of the pattern is a place for your personal reflection, a place for you to write a message to the person that you're creating this quilt to, or just to write your own personal thoughts as you continue on this journey. This is the part where your setting comes into play, where you're located, how your community responded, how your work responded, and how you responded to news of the coronavirus is all part of your individual setting. And it will not be the same for any other quilter participating in this quilt. So this is an opportunity for you to jot down your thoughts. Today to make these nine patch units, I'm going to be using just a regular ruler and a rotary cutter to cut my two and a half inch strips. And then I'm going to sub cut those into two and a half inch squares. Now I like to use a Marty Michelle square that is two and a half inches to sub cut, which I'll show you, but you can use any square. You can use any sort of a square where you can easily see that two and a half inch square unit. Let's take a look at cutting. When pressing, I like to use a wool mat close to my machine and a small steam fast travel iron. I use a dry iron. When you introduce, uh, when you use a wet iron, 
and you use steam, you actually introduce stretch into your fabric. So whenever possible, use a dry iron. The exception would be if you have a crease pressed into your fabric, like I do with this binding tail. So I would first try by just setting the iron on the fabric to see if I can get rid of that crease. And in this particular case, I did. Sometimes I can't and I have to use a little spray of water first. But one of the things to remember is that I'm pressing, I'm not ironing. So I'm actually setting the iron in its location for five seconds. I taught my granddaughters to count to five bananas. One banana, two banana, three banana, four banana, five banana. And that allows you to go ahead and get that seam pressed out. Now, when I flip it over, I can still see a bit of the fold. So I might have to use some, some steam to get that pressed out, but it's looking pretty good to cut that. You'll see that I have an odd arrangement of fabrics here, and that's because I'm actually constructing four different quilts. So you'll see that I have a bright and a deep rich in just the regular cottons. And I also have a deep rich and a bright in my batiks. Now what's important to note with these two and a half inch squares is that you want to make sure that you're not using a fabric that has too much pattern or variety. So if the size of the design in the pattern is over an inch and a half, I would recommend that that would not be a good fabric to use in this quilt. And in this case, when you've got a fabric that changes colors from one side to the other, that's one to use with caution. You're going to have to make sure that you've cut that in such a way that it reads as one color for that nine patch unit. Whether you cut one strip at a time or multiple strips at a time, you're going to want to follow whatever cutting method works best for you. I like to use the mat to square up my strips of fabric. I have these folded in half with wrong sides together so I can see the fabric on the outside. And then I'll use my rotary ruler and I drop my little finger off the edge of that ruler so it can't wiggle for me. And I make that cut. Now, if you are participating in the fabric exchange, you may want to consider whether or not you want to personalize any of your blocks with the name or the location of the quilter that sent you the fabric. So for example, this fabric for me came from Mary A from Long Island, New York. And I'm going to end up, when I finish, I'm going to make sure that in her block that I have her name listed on her block somewhere to make it a true friendship quilt. So I'll be keeping this piece of my selvage aside so I can make sure I can mark that later. When I do mark it, I'll be using a Micron fabric pen. I won't be using a Sharpie because a Sharpie, when you launder it, does change colors. Sometimes it can become more of a brown look than a black. So at this point, I could take these same strips and I could use my ruler to cut two and a half inch squares, making certain that I'm square at the top of the strip and the side of the strip and make those cuts. I need five pieces of fabric to make this unit. Or typically I might be cutting one strip at a time or strips on top of each other. And so if that were the case, I would just put the strips right on top of each other And I like to use my Marty Michelle instrument that's just two and a half inch square. Now we need to have five squares for the nine patch unit, but I'm gonna cut a sixth square for that outer border, which also has two and a half inch squares. So I need three cuts. And then I move the two and a half inch to the side, leaving my fabric in place so it doesn't wiggle. So now I have my three cuts. Now remember, I had the fabric, the one fabric, that did change colors. So I'm gonna take the time before I start my nine patch unit and try to decide which fabrics need to go where in that nine patch unit to make it look so it's the most uniform.
as I lay out my fabrics, this particular fabric reads distinctly darker than the rest of these. So I'm going to take this one out and I'll use it in my outer border. I have one, two, three fabrics that have a touch of pink in the corner. So I'm going to turn those so that those corners face in. And then I'll take this one and place him in the middle. And I know it seems like a lot of time to spend, but in this particular case, it's time well spent to make sure that I have that block laid out. Other fabrics that are more uniform in nature, it will not matter where I place them in the particular block. With my leftovers, I'm gonna set them aside. I might find a use for them later in the quilt. I'm constructing my quilts four different colorways. So I have my background fabrics all cut and ready to go. I like to chain piece when I'm doing my two and a half inch squares and I like to also use them as beginners and enders. If you've never chain pieced before, let me show you how that's done. Here I am at my machine and I like to set up and be organized on my sewing table so that I make sure that I'm piecing the right fabrics in the right direction. Now if you recall, I had my brights set up in such a way that they'll go into the, the actual quilt block like this. So I'm going to take the time because these are a certain direction for me. I'm going to take the time and I'm going to make sure that I have placed my background fabric on each of these units, the direction that they need to go. And I'll slide these two units off to the side. Remember I said I like to chain piece. I also like to use my two and a half inch squares as a way of doing a beginner and an ender. So you'll see me using those with all of my blocks as we move on in the future. I'm using an Orofil 50 weight thread. It's a nice lightweight thread and I'm using just an off white kind of a sandstone color that's neutral because then I don't have to change the colors as I'm moving from one quilt to the next. I also like to use a nice light colored thread because then it's easier to see in case I need to rip out. And hopefully I won't. As the unit gets close to the end of my foot, I just slide the next piece in and because I have them laying on my quilt tabletop in the order that they're supposed to go, I'm ready for it to slide right into place. So those first three units of my Batik Bright are complete. And now I can go ahead and move into the other fabrics that I have. And I don't need to worry as much about uh, this additional pieces because I don't have anything else that's directional. When we were talking about fabric choices on the background cutting video, I talked about the avoiding a directional fabric, simply like this one. This fabric is definitely directional, but what I have chosen to do is within my nine patch units, I'm going to make sure that I have fabrics going every direction possible. So I will have some blocks this way, some blocks this way, some blocks this way, and some blocks this way. So that the direction doesn't define the block, it's actually just the words that I want to include. So I'm going to need three pieces of each of those fabrics as well.
that is my bright cotton blenders and prints. And here is my deep and rich cotton blenders and prints. I'll do three of that as well. And then I'll go ahead and show you how I like to unchain my chain pieced units. By chain piecing, you are saving time and thread. By not having to take it, the block units out of my machine every single time, I'm saving quite a bit of time. When I finish, I have a nice chain of block units here and I'm ready to snip them apart and begin to put the third unit on so that I can complete the rows for the nine patch subunits. When I am chain piecing, I like to use a chain ripper to take my units apart. It's simply a little seam ripper that sets in a base. I usually have it sitting right next to my sewing machine. And so as I pop those units apart, they're laying in a pile in the reverse order of how they came through my machine. So if they are in a particular order because I had a certain fabric or direction that I was trying to follow, I simply have to turn my pile over and I am ready to go again. And if you recall, this would be my fabric that was, uh, had that darker towards the inside. Now I'm ready to put that next side right here. Here's my middle unit. So they're in the direct opposite order of how they came through the machine. When I'm not using my chain ripper, I just put it back in the base. And then it's sitting on my sewing table and I can find it easily. Sometimes it's really hard to find a seam ripper because it's laying underneath a pile of fabric. That way it's where I can find it. So now I'm ready to sew the third unit onto each row so that I can put my nine patch subunits together. They came out of my machine, row one, row two, row three of those subunits and that's exactly how I'll feed them back through again. So I'll begin with a colored unit and then I'll go to a background unit next. And again, I'll chain piece these to make everything faster and more efficient. Go ahead and chain piece the next units for the bright and for the deep and rich and I'll do all those and, and rip those apart. I'll show you a pressing technique, pinning it back together and completing your nine patch unit. I'll use my chain ripper to pop apart the three part units in the same way that I did the two part units. So there's the three part unit and again I can just pop those units apart and they are in the opposite order of how they came through my machine. So I'm ready to press them and go ahead and put those nine patch units together. As far as pressing the rest of the units, the pattern instructions tell you to press towards the colored fabric. In this particular quilt with my brights, I have a black background, but my colored fabric is still those batiks. So in order to press it towards that fabric, I first would set the fabric that I'm pressing it towards up, and I set the iron on it, and I set the seam. Then I flip that seam open, and I set the iron there for five seconds. 
I'm not ironing, I'm just pressing. By the same token, I do it to the other side as well. And this is where it's important. This unit is going to be as straight as what you make it be. As long as I've done my quarter inch and I've not tailed off towards the end, I should be able to open that up and press this unit nice and straight into a nice straight rectangle. If it's not a straight rectangle, you need to diagnose why isn't it a straight rectangle and determine if there's something that you can do to fix it. So I have those two units pressed to the outside like the instructions say. The center unit, again, I'm pressing towards that colored fabric. So I'd set the iron on the colored fabric because I'm pressing towards it to set the seam and then press it open. Count to five bananas and I'm ready to do the same on the other side. Set the iron on the colored fabric because that's what I'm pressing towards. Flip this over and press that in place. And again, I've kept that nice and straight. So these units should measure two and a half by six and a half inches. If they don't, it's time to check your quarter inch or check your cutting. As far as putting the units together and preparing to stitch them together, you would fold the first row over the second row. And you can see that those seams nest. Now there's a couple different tricks if you're going to pin. Some people don't like to pin, but then when they open it up, their, their seams might have wiggled on them. If you're going to pin, either always pin above the seam, so as this is coming through our machine, I'm going to pin above the seam so that when my needle catches right there into that fabric, I can pull my pin and not go over the needle. Another method that I like to use is I like to use a fork pin. A fork pin is a two-pronged pin that has a bent edge that when those seams are nested, you can place both sides of the prongs on either side of that seam allowing it to hold that seam perfectly nested in place. Either method, whether you pin above the seam or use the fork pin, will yield the result of having a seam that doesn't wiggle and move and get pushed around by your machine. I like to just use a couple of fork pins. I keep them on my pin pal. And I just keep reusing them as I feed pieces through my machine. So I'll feed that piece directly through my machine, removing those fork pins as I get close to them. And so with the needle down and through the first part of that seam, I can remove that fork pin. When I open up the unit, I will see that those seams are perfectly matched. And I'm ready to go ahead and sew on the third row of the very same unit. Then I'll press it and have it ready to go. Once the nine patch unit is complete, it's important to press it open and get it nice and flat. So the instructions tell you to press these seams open and that's so that you reduce the bulk in the area where the seams come together. Another method I like to use is to fan the seams and press them open. So I'm using this block because of the dark background. It makes it real obvious to see the difference between the black and the yellow. When you're fanning the seams, you literally just take your fingers and you pull that seam apart. It'll pop those two threads and you'll go the direction that it wants to go. So I'm looking at the black. I'm going to move that towards the black and I've got that black towards the black. And then I can take my iron and I can set it on that seam. 
and count to five. And move it across the block until I've done that for all three little short seams. And by fanning the seam, now I have a very flat seam right there. And it's going to piece quite nicely. It's going to quilt beautifully. I can press those seams open or I can fan the seams. I'll press this one open. First, I finger press it before setting my iron on and counting to five bananas. Again, it's just a hot iron, does not have any moisture or steam. So whether you have fanned the seams and pressed them open or just press the seams open, you're looking for a nice flat press so that you have no bulk where those seams come together. The pattern says that the unfinished nine patch unit should measure six and a half inch square. So get your six and a half inch squaring tool and set it on the unit and see how you've come out. This is where you learn to make some adjustments to your quarter inch if that's necessary. And then put that in your complete pile and you can keep working on them as you go or you could work on them at your leisure, or you can work on them as beginners and enders. However you wanna attack these nine patch, it's up to you. If you don't like to take the time to set the seam, another little tool you can use is just grab a little rubberized garden glove from the local garden store, and you can lay your fabric right side down with your seams up. Remember, I'm pressing towards the colored fabric, and I can pull those apart using the rubberized garden tip, which gives me a nice, full pull so I don't end up losing any part of my seam in the press. And then I can run the iron over that seam, holding again for five seconds, and do the same on the other side. And again, I'm responsible for keeping this nice and straight so I have a nice true rectangle when I finish. And that's how I would do it if I didn't set the seam first. Well, there we go. In just a short hour, I was able to put together eight different blocks for my four different quilts. I've got my bright batiks here with the black background, my deep and rich batiks with kind of a cream background. I've got two blocks that I made, and this was the one out of the binding tails. Can't tell that. And then this is of my deep and rich sol or uh, cottons and then my bright cottons I made four blocks because I made the one from my exchange fabric here I had one from a binding tail and I had two from scraps that I just pulled from my stash so with this one you can see this is the fabric that has that directional word print and you can also see that from four feet away you can't tell what direction that fabric is going and so it's going to create the quilt the look that I want it to create and I'm not going to worry so much about direction on that as what I am about just how the overall colors are going to play together in the in the quilt now I'm going to take a tip from one of my dear friends Pat when she's working on blocks and she's setting them aside she takes a little sticky note or a little piece of paper and she marks an of units that she has completed. Not going to be hard for me to keep track of these two right now, but I really should take this pile of four when I stack it up, put a note on the top and say that I have four. Because when I'm creating 80 units, it's really important that I don't create too many of any one colorway that keeps me from making it all work together as a total quilt. I thank you for joining me for this particular video session. I'm so glad that you decided to jo join us for the COVID Friends Quilt Journey. If you have any questions along the way, take a look at the top of your pattern to see which shop you're participating through. Contact them first because it's possible that they have, uh, that they're doing something different in their shop that I might not be doing. If they can't answer your questions or if you have a question about the instructions or how to construct the blocks, contact me by phone or email. The best way to reach me usually is by email or by Facebook message. I get those a little quicker than when I do some of the phone messages. I thank you so much and I hope that you stay safe throughout this pandemic.